It's so good to have you if you are a guest here this morning. I kind of want to fill you in on where we're at in our series so far. We are in a series called Told You So. We're looking at prophetic scripture. And really the heart behind this is that we would see that what's in the Bible will come to pass. Amen? It, some things have already come to pass. Other things have yet to come to pass. But what is in scripture will come to pass. This morning we're going to be in Joel chapter 2, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get them out and turn there. Uh, you can also flip over to Acts chapter 2 and put a marker there. We'll be uh, there shortly after Joel chapter 2. My intention this morning, what I pray, is that our hearts would be so stirred for Jesus, that we would have such a passion to see a move of God in our lives personally, that we would recognize the urgency that we really do need to have in the days and the times that we do live in. So, man, I pray that this morning that you would just catch a fire of God in this place. You know, we've gone through seasons here at Journey to where I feel like us as a congregation have just been going hard after the Lord, and we've experienced a level of outpouring of His presence that was just absolutely incredible, and I think that we do here still, but I think there's another level that God is calling us into. There's another level that God wants us to go into, but it's going to take a personal desire in each and every one of our hearts just for Him, just to have this relationship with Him and to develop this, that we wouldn't just be Sunday morning normal Christians, but we would be a people who are going hard after Him and every single moment is just dedicated to the Lord. May that be our story, yeah? So that's why I pray this morning that this, this message this morning would stir your hearts to have this urgency just to live for God in every aspect of our lives. Joel chapter 2. Who's ready for the word of God? If you're ready, say, let's go. Yeah. Verse 28 says this, and afterwards, and afterwards in context of Joel chapter 2, right before this, this is referring to the last days. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Say, all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The great and dreadful day of the Lord is referring to the last generation right before Christ returns. Verse 32, and everyone, this is really good news, this is really great news, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. I've entitled my message this morning, The Last Generation. The Last Generation, if you like my notes this morning, you can text notes to the number that may be coming up on the screen, I'm not sure if they got that or not. If you have that phone number saved in your, in your phone, you can text notes to that number and receive my notes this morning. Let's pray right now. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you right now to speak. Lord, just as the young boy prayed, Lord, speak for your servants are listening. God, we recognize that, God, we are your servants. We are here to serve you, and God, we want to say to you this morning, would you speak to us this morning? God, we have to hear your voice. Lord, I pray this morning, God, that you would take your Logos word, your Logos being the written word of God, and you would make it so alive in our hearts, God, that, Lord, we would not leave this place the same, but, Lord, we would leave with a fire inside of us to go after you, God, to live for you, to be about your business, Jesus. That, God, you are coming back, and you are coming back soon, I believe, God. It's going to be like a thief in the night, the Word of God says. And so, Lord, may we be a people who are prepared and who are ready, who are about your business, Jesus, who are living fully and completely for you. 
And so, Father, we thank you. We love you. Everyone said this morning, come on. Amen, amen. amen. There are many things that are good, but in the worst way. I think about a deep tissue massage. It hurts, but it hurts so good. You know what I'm saying? McDonald's. When you eat McDonald's, I don't know about you, but I really do enjoy a quarter pounder with cheese. But I eat it like once a year. Why? Because if you eat that every single day, it's going to kill you, y'all. I mean, I'm just going to tell you. And it makes you feel terrible afterwards. Can I get an amen? Like, I don't know. It feels like my blood's slowing down. It's, it's, it's awful, but man, it does taste really, really good. It's addictive. I, I get it. It's addictive, and they made it that way. It hurts going down, but it tastes good going down at the same time. I also think about buying that new car, right? You buy a new car, that new car smell, it's amazing. Next thing you know, about a month later, you get a, a car payment. And you think to yourself, man, why did I buy this car? I've never thought to myself, man, I'm really glad I bought this car and when, I bought, when I took out a car payment. The last thing that, I, that, that comes to mind, things that are good but in the worst way, is childbirth, and that's all I'm going to leave. I'm just going to leave it right there. The end times, the last days, they're going to be a bit like this. The end times are going to be the best of times, but also the worst of times. So I want to look at this, the best of times and the worst of times in the context of Joel chapter 2, but in order to really look at Joel chapter 2 in the context of this, we've got to go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches a message and 3,000 people come to faith, and he actually uh, quotes this passage from Joel chapter 2. Let me give you a little backstory, though, what happens at the beginning of this chapter. Incredible move of the Holy Spirit happens. These disciples, about 120 people, they gather in the upper room. Many of you know this story. The Holy Spirit comes into that place, and there is this wind, and then there's this fire, and they begin to speak with tongues, a language that is unknown. But then with this wind, people from all over come, and they want to see what is happening going on, and they hear this language that they know but that these people, these Galileans, don't actually really speak. And they're baffled, they're blown away. How do they know this language? And so they're hearing something that is in their language. And so with this, though, some people are blown away. Wow, this can only be God. But others, they're accusing these people of being drunk. How many know, man, that's a pretty wild scene. If the Holy Spirit is moving like that, and these people are accusing them of being drunk, that's kind of a different level right there. And so, but Peter says, listen, they're not drunk. This is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Those people, they are not drunk. This is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Let's read this together. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. It says this, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So quoting the passage that we had read earlier. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Up until this point, the spirit was only being poured out and reserved for a select few in the Old Testament. So it says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter that day stands up and says, they are not drunk. This is the fulfillment of the prophet Joel, which we read earlier. Now the statement, great and glorious day of the Lord, makes this also very clear that this is a last days, an end time, last generation prophecy that it started in Acts 2 and it continues to be fulfilled to this day. So this, there's this principle called dual fulfillment. It's a theological term called dual fulfillment. 
So with that, it's first, it's a smaller fulfillment, and second fulfillment is a fuller fulfillment. So you can see the smaller fulfillment here takes place in Acts chapter 2, and Peter refers to it. What happens? God pours out his spirit upon 120 people. They begin to prophesy in tongues. Now a fuller fulfillment is going to be for the last generation or in the last days. And that fulfillment is going to be an outpouring of the spirit in the presence of God in such a way that the world has never seen. Like God is going to pour out his spirit even beyond what happened in that upper room. And I don't know about you, but I want to experience that. I want to see that. I want to see an outpouring of the spirit in the presence of God in that way. But why is that going to be happening? Because it's going to be the only hope that we have. It's going to be what gets us through that last generation. I want an outpouring of the spirit of God. Let me give you a definition of outpouring. It's this. Pouring out or outpouring it means a passionate or exaggerated outburst, a rainfall in rich abundance. In the last generation, there will be an increased operation of the gifts of the Spirit, which started in the book of Acts and continues to this day, which means Joel chapter 2 applies both to Acts chapter 2 and to the end time church, to that last generation. So what am I saying this morning? If in the last days God will pour out his spirit, are we living in the last days? I can say unequivocally, yes, we are living in the last days. Now let me clarify this, because in the last days started back in Acts chapter 2, okay? The last days started back in Acts chapter 2. Now when you think about this, we're going to read this later on uh, today, but the Bible says a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. How are we living in the last days? Because in God's term, that's only really two days since Acts chapter 2. Okay, so we are living in the last days. Now, the question is, though, are we living in the last generation? Are we living in the last generation? I want to answer that there at the end, but let's kind of go back now to the statement that the last generation will experience the best of times and the worst of times. We're going to experience, the last generation will experience the best of times and the worst of times. So number one this morning... The last generation, now let me ask you this, do you want the bad news or the good news first? Let's go with the bad news, I already had it in my notes anyways. The last generation, because we need the good news after the bad news, right? The last generation will experience the worst of times. Now before we dive into this statement that the last generation will experience the worst of times, man, I feel like what Tyler shared this morning it was from the Holy Spirit. You got to know in the worst of times, in what is to come, which it will come to pass because it's in Scripture, we cannot be afraid. The people of God cannot have fear. We've got to have this childlike faith that God is going to pull us through. There's plenty of precedent for the people of God to be protected by God. We're going to talk about that in the second point here in a moment. But I want to tell you this. As we're going through this point this morning, I'm telling you, do not be afraid. So the first thing that I want to give you, the first sign, the first reason it will be the worst of times because the church will be persecuted. The church will be persecuted, Revelation 12, 12 through 13. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Satan will be at full blast against his church. Why? Why will he be doing everything he possibly can to come against the, the people of God, God's church, God's bride? Because his, he knows that his time is short. He knows time is incredibly short. And so he's going to do everything he possibly can to come against the church. It's going to be like he's an animal with rabies, he's stuck in a corner. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's going to be an ugly scene. He's going to do everything he possibly can to throw at the church. But we got to know that God is going to protect his people. He's good. The enemy's going to come at full force in the last generation. The second reason it's going to be the worst of times is because of deception. There's going to be 
massive amounts of deception. 1 Thessalonians 5.3, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now this is referring to the Antichrist who will bring peace. The world will be crying out for peace, peace, peace. And the Antichrist will get raised up in power, will bring peace. He will establish a one world government, a one currency. And then he will ask, okay, listen, I've done this. Now I want you to worship me. And he'll ask for worship. And matter of fact, he'll back it up by signs, miracles in that time. He'll back it up in that way. But you cannot be deceived by it. You cannot be deceived by it. Jesus warned the last generation to not be deceived. He says this in Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. Church, it is so important to keep your eyes and your attention focused on Jesus and not the things of this world. Do not be distracted. Keep your eyes on, this, on Jesus. Do not be led astray. The third reason will be the worst of times is because of wickedness. Because of wickedness. L- listen, wickedness and righteousness will be in an all time high. Jesus tells a parable in, in Matthew 13. And it's a parable of, uh, of the weeds and the wheat. And he says, Jesus sows the seed for the wheat. Then the thief comes, uh, someone else comes behind him, Satan comes up behind him and sows the weeds. And he says, okay, don't pick out, to the farmer, don't pick out the seed because you might pick out the wheat. What will end up happening in the last days is righteousness will be at its full maturity and wickedness will be at its full maturity. You see, as the dark gets darker, the light will get lighter. We cannot be deceived. It will be at an all-time high. Matter of fact, Jesus says this in Luke 7, 17, 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. So according to Genesis 6, 5, before the flood, mankind was corrupt and thought only of evil continually. And so Jesus promised that the time of his coming would be much more like the days of Noah. So you might be asking in this room right now, when you're thinking about it being the worst of times and what we kind of went through this morning, first off, again, we cannot have fear. But you might be thinking, is the people of God here? And I'll just answer the question right now. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if we'll be here. I don't know if, if, if we will or not. I don't, uh, it depends on pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. It's a point of view that many of you have probably studied and looked at before. And I don't know if we're going to be uh, here or not. I really do not know. No one can say 100% sure whether we are here or not. People can say, man, I think that possibly we won't be here or possibly we will be here. But I do not know. All I know is this, is that it's going to pan out. I'm pan-trib, y'all pan-tribulation. Yeah, everything's going to pan out. But here's the, here's the thing. If you got to keep your eyes and your attention on Jesus, do not be distracted. Amen. We got to know this. It's going to be the worst of times, but also at the same time, it is going to be the best of times. The last generation, point number two this morning, is the last generation will be the best of times. Isn't that good? Yes. Acts 2, 17 through, thir- uh, 17 through 18. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on who? All. Come on, say a little louder. All. All people, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will what? They will prophesy. So good news this morning. The last generation will experience an increased measure of the spiritual gifts. 
prophecy, visions, dreams, miracles, signs, and wonders will be prevalent in that day. It will be increased in the last generation. And these manifestations will lead to three things this morning that I want to give you that will make it the best of times. The first thing I want to give you is it will be the best of times because of an end-time harvest of souls. The church will see people giving their heart to Jesus like they've never seen before in the history of mankind. Many people will give their life to the Lord, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You see, in conjunction with this outpouring of the Spirit of God, we will see a massive end-time harvest of souls in that last generation. The gospel will be proclaimed with power and with might to every people group, every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. And now, this has not happened yet. Top missions organizations estimate that there's about 7,400 different people groups who have not heard the gospel yet. That might seem like a lot, 7,400, but when you think about it, if every church just took one people group who had not heard the gospel, we could see this fulfillment happen very, very quickly, right? To where every single person would hear the gospel. Back about three years ago or so, I was reading this book called Pray Igbalo by Lou Engel, and it talks about in one of the chapters, this specifically, talks about how there are many people groups who have not heard the gospel yet. And I'm, as I'm reading this, my heart just kind of leapt and I was like, Lord, can you help us reach one of those people groups? God, would you give us favor and direction and a strategy to reach one of these people groups? And so I took up joshuaproject.org and it kind of tells you where all the different people groups who have not heard the gospel are. As I brought it up, I quickly saw that there's a, there's a tribe that lives in the jungle that, that's in Guyana who has never heard the gospel. Bishop and I have been talking about this and just saying, okay, man, Lord, how do we reach these people who have never heard the gospel? I don't know, it's kind of a big dream, but what if the Lord used us as a church to facilitate that tribe who has never heard the gospel before to hear the gospel for the first time? What if we invested in those churches there and then those churches, because they're not going to have some uh, middle-aged white guy walk in there and share the gospel. They're not going to listen to him. But what if one of their own from one of their churches were able to invest in them and then they went and shared the gospel with these people? What if that happened? What if God allowed us to do that? That would be absolutely incredible. So pray with me. Pray with me that God will give us the strategy, the personnel, the people, the church connections that we need. I think Bishop saw a lot of favor already uh, with that, even on his last trip that he went down there. We should make connections to allow us to reach these people. I believe that we will. Every tribe will hear the gospel. May we be a part of that. Amen? The second reason it will be the best of times is because God's people will be protected. There's no reason to fear because the people of God will be protected. Listen, despite all the evil that the world will experience in the last generation, the people of God will be protected and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this, Psalm 27, 5. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, and he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Psalm 91, 1 through 2. Uh, he He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. God gave me the scripture for us back about two months ago that we need to be this people He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High God. He who dwells in the secret place. That we be a people who dwell in the secret place. That we have a passion to be with Jesus and to meet with Jesus on a daily basis. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High God. Here's the promise, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Listen, there's... Plenty of precedent for the people of God being protected when all this other mayhem and craziness is going on around them. I think about about Noah, how he was protected. 
in those times. I think about Israel, how they were protected by the plagues of Egypt. I think about also Israel becoming a nation in 1948. That was a miracle that that happened. There is no doubt about it. There is plenty of precedent to know that God is going to protect his people. But we've got to have this unwavering faith. When there's war, rumors of wars, and all this craziness going on around us, we have got to stand, and we've got to be so sure that the Lord is with us. We've got to have this confidence. We've got to know that God is going to set our feet upon a rock. We've got to know that he is with us through every trial, every storm, every situation. We cannot have an unwavering faith if we are that last generation. We've got to stand strong. There's wars, rumors of wars. Even now, it's escalating in the Middle East. I just want to take a moment right now. Can we just pray for Israel in this room? Is that okay? Let's pray for Israel right now. Obviously, Iran attacked last night or yesterday. God, we pray right now for Israel, Jesus, your people. God, we pray protection around them, Father God. That, Lord, you would set their feet upon a rock. God, we pray for the salvation of those who do not know you, Jesus. That, Lord, they would cry out to you, God. That, Lord, there would be a great revival amongst the Jewish people, God. That, Lord, you would deliver them and save them and protect them, God, and give them wisdom in navigating the situations that are coming, God. Lord, we thank you for your people, God, and we pray that, Lord, that, God, you would give the leadership wisdom, God. But we love you and we thank you for that, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. When there are wars and rumors of wars, we've got to have this unwavering faith. But listen, how are we going to have this unwavering faith? We can't just sit idly by and just hope that we're not going to be shaken. We've got to be a people of prayer. We've got to be a people of worship. We've got to be a people who are so hungry for the Lord, which leads me to the third reason it will be the best of times, because there will be a global prayer movement. There's going to be a global prayer movement. Malachi 1, 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense. So in the Old Testament, incense represents prayer. So in every place, Prayer will be offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. In the last days, as the drama increases, there will be a steady soundtrack from, uh, from the earth to heaven of the people of God interceding and in worship and chasing after the Lord. You see, I believe that the Lord is even now, he's raising up intercessors around the planet, around the world. What are intercessors? Those who would stand in the gap and pray for those who cannot. I believe he's raising up intercessors within this congregation, people of prayer, people, you might be wondering, man, why am I waking up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning? Could it be that God's trying to get your attention and calling you to be an intercessor, to stand, be a, be, be a watchman on the wall, to stand and, and to pray for the people of Israel, to be, pray, to, be, to be in prayer for a move of God and revival in this generation? If you're a person who wakes up in the middle of night, you have no idea why, I want to encourage you, pray, 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 be a person of prayer, be a person of, of intercession. I believe the Lord is raising up intercession in this house, that we would be a people of prayer who understand the place of prayer. It's part of spiritual warfare. You see, this battle is not going to be won with a closed fist. It's not going to be won with a gun. What's it going to be won by? It's going to be won by a people who are on their knees in prayer, a people who are praying, who are on their knees. May this house be a house of prayer for all nations. We can't just hope to be, we've got to take action. You know, there's many ways if you can get involved with prayer. We have pre-service prayer here on Sunday mornings at 8.30, it's right back here in this room. We have Wednesday night prayer at 7 p.m. every single Wednesday night. We're praying, we're interceding. Matter of fact, we interceded and prayed for Israel just two weeks ago. That was our entire night. We're just praying for Israel. Um, 
We have uh, also Saturday morning prayer at 8 a.m. in this room. And find a time, be a person of prayer, get involved. That's how we're going to stand firm if, in fact, we are a part of the last generation. Streetside prayer. Streetside prayer, amen, brother. See Will over here. Last thing I want to give you, which is the question that I kind of posed at the very beginning that many of us are probably fascinated by. Are we living in the last generation? Are we a part of that last generation? Point number three this morning. I can't say 100% that we are in the last generation. I can't. But I will say this, that when you look at Scripture, it seems like if our interpretation is accurate, that we are a part of the last generation. Again, I cannot say 100%. And this morning as we're going through the, I only want to give you two things that really stick, stay out, uh, stick out to me when it comes to this, that we are a part of the last generation. But am I saying 100% that we are? No, I am not. And even when I give you dates, and, uh, dates as far as years are concerned, I'm not saying it's going to happen in that year either. All I'm saying is, is it looks like it's going to happen around that time frame, all right? So I'm not, I'm not saying unequivocally for sure we are part of the last generation, but everything in Scripture, I feel like, uh, pa- Pastor Jim talked about this last week, we're not going to know uh, the day or the hour, but what are we going to know? We're going to know the times and the season, right? We're going to know the time and the season. I believe things are pointing that direction. So the first thing that I want to give you is this, Israel becoming a nation is a sign that we are living in the last generation. It is a sign that we are living in the last generation. Matthew 24, 32 through 34. And even as you give you the scripture, we don't have time to really dive into this fully. I encourage you, if you're interested in this, go and dive into this. Study it on your own time. Let's read this together, verse 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. So a fig tree throughout Scripture represents Israel. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as it twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Again, if you go back and you study this, you'll find that the fig tree in Scripture represents Israel. So this is likely referring to Israel becoming a nation. I say likely. I'm not saying it definitely is. I'm saying likely. It's likely referring to Israel becoming a nation, which happened in 1948. So the generation that sees Israel become a nation, again, will not pass away before the return of Christ. So this begs the question, what is a generation then? Is it 70 or 80 years? Maybe. I can't say definitely it is. Is it 70 or 80 years? Maybe. Psalm 90.10 would lead you to believe that perhaps a generation would be 70 or 80 years. It, it reads and says this, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Now, is a generation 120 years? <laughs> Maybe. Look at this, Genesis 6.3. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. So that would put this prophecy, if our interpretation is accurate, if many scholars' interpretation is accurate, to put Christ's return around, 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 around. I want to emphasize that. I'm not giving you this year as is definitely this, but 80 years if you count it, is what? It's the 2028 time frame. If a generation is 80 years, give or take a decade or two and some time, if our calendar and timeline could be off, then it would be around 2028. Or if a generation is 120 years, it would be around 2068. We can't know for sure, okay? We can't know for sure. Nor am I saying these are exact years. I want to say that again. The point is, that with this, man, everything would point to it's got to be soon, y'all. It has got to be soon. 
So that's one sign. The next sign that points to this being the last generation is the 7,000 year timeline. The 7,000 year timeline, let me explain this to you. When you study scripture, you'll see a timeline of seven consistently. The number seven represents completion or perfection. The number six represents imperfection or man. So the timeline since creation to Christ's return, I would submit to you, mirrors the creation story, which happened in seven days. The creation story happened in when, when God in Genesis created all that we see, created this earth, it happened in what? Seven days. After the sixth day, what happened? God rested. Here's something else, and I said this at the beginning. I refer back to this. The Bible's clear that a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Look at this passage. It actually is found in Scripture twice. Psalm 94. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Second Peter, he says this as well, 3.8, inspired by Scripture, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So this, what I'm about to say, this is not approximate. This is not approximate. So take, please, please, please take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. So if creation mirrors the timeline of God's return, there was 2,000 years from creation, roughly 2,000 years from creation to Abraham. It was about 2,000 years. Abraham to Christ's coming and his death was another 2,000 years. There's been now 2,000 years since Christ's death, and now where we are at today. Many scholars believe Christ died in about 2033 or so, 2030, 2031, 2032, most say 2033. So you take 2,000 years from that, you can do the math. All right, so the millennial reign will then happen after this 6,000 year period of time because if it mirrors creation, we have the millennial reign where God rested and we will rule and reign with Christ here on the earth during that period of time. Isn't that incredible? So those are just two instances that should allow us to see that perhaps, I'm not saying definitely, there's a high probability, man, that we are living in this last generation. Now, are we living in the last days? Absolutely. Last days started back in Acts chapter 2. Are we living in the last generation? I mean, I think everything would point to that. There are many other things that we could go through and many of the examples that would lead us to believe that we are living in the last generation. But what's the point of me saying all this? What's the point of me saying that in the last generation will experience the best of times and the worst of times and that more than likely we are living in the last generation? What's the point of this morning? The point of this morning is that, church, we've got to be a people who keep their eyes and their attention on Jesus because our redemption is drawing near. We've got to be our people who are steadfast, who are unwavering in our faith, and who keep our attention on Jesus. We can't be messing around right now. We've got to be in the game. We've got to be in the battle. We can't just go through life just thinking everything's going to work out and everything's going to be okay. Yes, God is going, to, is going to take care of his people as we hide ourselves in the secret place underneath the shadow of the Almighty. But if we are living in the last days, it is going to be the worst of times, but I'm here to tell you it's also going to be the best of times because I'm excited because we're going to get to experience the outpouring of the Spirit of God in a revival like that has never been seen on the face of the planet. And what's incredible is that God has trusted you to live right now. He has trusted you to live right now. You could have been alive at any point, but he trusted you to live right now. You've got to keep your attention, your focus, and your gaze on Jesus. Matter of fact, it says this in Luke 21, 25 through 28, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, referring to the last generation, on the earth, the nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man 
coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When we see these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. (laughs) Secondly, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? Because we need the Holy Spirit to fill us up in order to navigate these last days, which goes back to this prophecy that we started with in the book of Joel. And that's in Acts, Acts 28, Acts 2, 28. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Listen to this. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and young men see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Church, we have got to be watchful. We've got to be waiting. We've got to be expectant for the Lord's return. It will suddenly happen like a thief in the night and we need the Holy Spirit to continually renew our minds daily. We have got to be so watchful in the times that we live in. We've got to ask, we can't, we can't not, we can't not wake up and think that we're going to make it through the day without spending time with Jesus. My heart and my passion for you this morning is that you would live with this urgency, this urgency and this great love and this desire for the Holy Spirit that the fire of God would be inside of you. That you would have this fire that's unquenchable, that just burns bright, that whenever you walk into the room, it's just contagious, that people would sense God within you. Listen, man, life is tough. I get it. Things happen and life is tough. And I'm not trying not to have compassion maybe for some things that you've walked through. But oftentimes it's about how we respond. You see, the Holy Spirit can come in. He can heal all those things in your life. If you just say to the Lord, I'm going to draw near to you, I'm going to press into you, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes in you, comes inside of you. He rips apart all the layers of hurt, of grief, of everything else, and he heals this place in your heart and in your life. My passion and my prayer for you is that you would just have this desire to be filled up with the Spirit of God. It's going to be impossible to make it in the worst of times if we do not make ourselves available to be filled up with the power and the Spirit of God on a daily basis. Now, when you're saved, do you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Yes, I'm not saying that, but there's something about the Holy Spirit coming upon people. We're going to go into a series in a couple weeks, our next series, on the Holy Spirit. We'll be talking a little bit about that. But we need the Holy Spirit to pour out upon his people. But it starts with the people who are hungry and who are thirsty for Jesus. Those who, are hungry, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, what does the Bible say? They shall be filled. They shall be filled. Would you rise with me in this room?